Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Heidi's Lane. This one is coming with a super special intro. Um, this has been hands down the hardest episode for me to release. Not because the episode's not fantastic, because it is. The episode itself, which is coming after this intro, is without a shadow of a doubt my absolute favorite episode I've ever recorded. I um, just re-listened to it right before recording this introduction. And, you know, sometimes I listen to things that I record and I'm like, was that even me talking? I don't remember saying hardly any of what I said. I don't remember knowing any of what I shared. And it's in those moments that I'm like, man, God does speak through each of us when he wants a message to come out. And even if the message that I shared or share, which is coming up, was meant for me to hear again today, I have to say it is exactly what I needed. Um, I really did. I really did. So this episode was originally recorded July 1st of this year. So roughly three and a half months ago, four actually, because today, today's Monday, the episode was supposed to go out today. And it's not going to go out until tomorrow, which Tuesday is when you're going to be listening to this. But the episode was recorded July 1st. And it was kind of a, um, it, it, I, uh, for lack of better words, I was inside of a, uh, I had just ended a relationship. The one that many of you guys ask me about on the regular. I don't typically answer because... The relationship um, has taken many shapes and forms and sizes. And so I've realized that because relationships do that, it's easier for me not to share my relationships online much, right? Uh, but after ending a relationship that week in July, um, I was in a really beautiful, reflective place which I think many of us get to after relationships. If we don't get there, we should start getting ourselves there because it truly is the only way for patterns to not continue to repeat. Like, and if you don't know what you did wrong in your last relationship, I was telling a friend the other day, the next relationship will show you. Like in that next relationship, when you show up as the same person you were previously, you'll be like, oh crap. Like this same thing is happening. Now I see it. Maybe I'm the common denominator, right? So I was inside of a very reflective place and I journaled essentially to you guys um, all about dating in my 40s. So if you are someone who, it, you don't even have to be in your 40s. Listen, if you are someone who is in a relationship and there is struggle or has been struggle, or if you've been in a relationship where there was struggle, or if you're someone looking to get in relationships and not repeat the same struggle, um, or if you're not in relationships because you don't know how to be in them, this episode is for you. I want you to know that you're not alone in what you go through. And I share the beauty of the multiple relationships that I've had in my life and also the beauty of what would be singular for those of you that are in that. Um, but I had recorded this podcast, back to what I was saying, um, right after my relationship had ended. And then like we do so many times, and maybe I'm the most notorious for this, I don't know. <sighs> I slowly got back into the relationship that um, he and I had decided to end. And, you know, mostly because I really love him 
and he really loves me. And when that's the case, and you see each other on paper, and you're like, man, this should work out, like two plus two equals four. Um, it's hard to let it go, you know. And so, gosh, it is not without an incredible amount of effort that he and I both put into this final round. Um, but once again, for some reason, it just didn't feel right. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I recorded the relationship, went back or re recorded the podcast, went back into the relationship, therefore held this episode because I was like, oh, I'm so scared. Like I had my team slicing and dicing the episode and can we cut it to pull out the part about the current relationship? And it, just, you know, I just, I held on to it. I'm like, okay, I'm not, obviously I'm not going to put something out to the world if I'm really trying to make something work with this man who, you know, I saw such an incredible future with. and. Um, but I, I think this is, I, I, and I, I know I speak to many of you out there when I say you're not alone if you're in a similar pattern, right? We see the good that a person has or the potential that a relationship has, and it's really hard for us to give up on it. Um, without further ado, I present to you guys my absolute favorite episode of Heidi's Lane. And I'm at about the year mark right now. So happy one year anniversary to us. Happy birthday. Um, we're celebrating by talking about relationships, which is fitting because it's a thing that seems to <laughs> be such a huge part of my life, really all of our lives, right? Um, all right, you guys, I love you. And I hope you get out of this uh, what I got out of it, recording it, and re-listening. Enjoy. This is my first modified, I mean, with the exception of my introduction podcast where I explained, I am trying not to be all or nothing these days, and I'm doing meet in the middle. And what meet in the middle looks like is not planning my podcast the way that I previously was, at least until Maddox leaves for his mission, because I only have a couple months left. As of this moment, yeah, I got about two months left, um, at least the moment that I'm recording it. And so what Meet in the Middle looks like is, like I was saying, not planning my podcast and instead just hopping on for what might be five minutes, it might be 10 minutes, it might be longer, who knows with me, and giving more of a thought, what's on my heart, what's on my mind, maybe even a life update. And I'm actually going to follow my heart. And against maybe what <laughs> might be advised. Um, I'm just going to go with what I feel. And today, I want to talk to the woman out there who has experienced divorce or death or any kind of a breakup and is attempting to date in her 40s. And I don't want to exclude 30s and 20s and 50s and 60s and 70s because I think this is a universal <clears throat> struggle, you know? Um, but man, dating in my 40s is really difficult for a lot of reasons. Um, I think first and foremost, it's difficult because I place a lot of pressure on myself. You've heard me say it, I, I think, in here before. But, you know, like, <clears throat> divorced twice. And then in another very public relationship. And it was a public divorce, right? And then to be in another, oh, there's a fly in here. To be in another, I'm in my car. To be in another public relationship that... Or, you know, I think more about that relationship was tracked with Dave than even my relationship with Chris, which was truly like created <laughs> around media. Um, and then to, you know, have it end the way that it did. And it just, it's not easy, right? But it's kind of like 
my all of my moves and all of my choices and all of my divorces and deaths <laughs> are public. Um, and, and I'm not complaining about the public aspect, but it is, you know, I, I, if I'm being honest, and I think anyone who experiences a divorce, it doesn't matter if you chose the divorce or the divorce chose you, it kind of in a way feels like there's a bit of a scarlet letter, you know, and I feel like there's three scarlet letters on me. <laughs> like, it's like I'm the girl who's twice divorced. But I think the world kind of sees it as three times divorced because they, uh, and when I say the world, it's very like relative to the people who know my life story. And, and I'm actually not complaining there. I, I really, uh, it's something I'm a little insecure about as it is. And there's a, there's two sides to this coin. And there's one side that is like, man, I have been through so many relationships. And I truly believe that every single relationship is such a beautiful and really effing difficult um, opportunity for growth. Like it is like every relationship is a teacher. I don't know if you've heard that, but it is true. Every relationship is a teacher. It's an opportunity for your partner at that time to hold up a mirror to you and show you what work you still have to do on yourself. And it's not like the partner, your partner is meant to be like, hey, look, here's where you are wrong, right? Although if you're in a relationship with someone who you trust and they hold up a mirror and say, hey, here's where you're wrong or here's where you could improve. If you trust them enough to be in a relationship with them, you should trust them enough to uh, maybe understand that there's some truth to that mirror that they're holding up. And it's really hard. Like it's really hard to be told that there are parts of you that need to improve. And also that's how we grow. So I, I do love that about relationships. Now, sometimes those mirrors aren't like your partner saying that, like I just said. Sometimes the mirror being held up is being with a person who triggers a part of you, right? Or triggers you and creates upset in you. And it doesn't matter what it's for. If there is someone who triggers you, and I'm going to use me, when I come across someone who triggers me or in a relationship when I'm triggered, I know enough and I've done enough therapy now and I've been through enough situations to know it's not really them. It's actually me. And there's some wound from my childhood that is unhealed, that is now being poked by my partner and causing me to react. Whereas if I was to, so for me, that's like a thread to pull on, right? And I can pull on that thread and I can say, okay, what is this wound? Even if my partner did something that I don't agree with or is wrong, right? It's still an opportunity for me to grow and to say, okay, what is it about my childhood or my past or my life or my being <clears throat> that is feeling hurt by what this person is doing, right? Okay, what do I need to heal? Because someone put it to me beautifully once. They said, and I'm going to get back to you. So th remember, we're talking about the flip sides of th this coin. We're still on side number one, which is the benefits of so many relationships. But my life coach once put it to me. She said, hey, when you have a wound, when you say burn your knee, right? And the wound is fresh, it doesn't matter how lightly someone pokes it. And sometimes they don't even have to poke it. They don't even have to brush against you. But that wound is throbbing. But if someone does barely brush it or pokes it or runs into you on accident, you're like, ow, like that hurts because there's a wound there, right? And now give it time, not bumping into things, not opening up the wound again, which we do as humans so many times. We put ourselves in situations where that knee is being bumped over and over and over. But if we can finally get that wound to heal and it becomes a scar, that same person can come up to you and bump into you and even poke it and even like slap it a little bit. And that scar is not going to hurt because the wound is healed. And she said, you know, same is in relationships and our life. When we are triggered, or as she calls it, hijacked, like an amygdala hijack, there's a part of us that we know, you know, it's that fight or flight response and someone triggers us. That's not, it's not really them. It's us. 
what wound have we not healed? Because if we had healed the wound, even if someone said something mean to us, right? Like I'm going to give the internet an example. Like there was a time where things said about me on the internet hurt me, right? It was a very short period of time. And there was no scar there. There was an open wound. I had to let it heal. I don't care now what people say about me. It does not matter because I just am immune to like, I've healed. I've healed that wound. So now it doesn't matter how hard someone pokes at me because they've poked so hard. It does not affect me. It does not affect me. That is an example of a wound healed. And they could actually say the meanest, most untrue thing. But because I know my truth and because it doesn't really matter to me, like I I don't know them, right? Um, and because the wound is healed, I'm complete. So in a relationship, the same thing goes. Now, that's this is all the good side. It's a good side. There's so many mirrors with so many partners, <laughs> you know, and, and there's been more people that I've dated in between that have never gotten talked about, very short lived, um, that still were some super painful, some super painful. And I'm not going to lie, some of the pain was caused by my own doing. Some of it was caused by their doing. And some, a lot, is caused by my doing. Like, I, I guys, I'm human. We're all human. There's not a person here listening that can honestly say that they are lily white in every relationship. It's just not how it is. And a lot of the times, we don't like to talk about the hard parts, the parts where we're wrong, you know? I mean, I do. <laughs> I'm at a point now where I do because it just, it, it's easier for me to not hide anything and talk about it. So there's beauty in my multiple relationships, because every single time I do feel like there, I can look back and I have. In fact, in this, in this most recent relationship, I started off by asking about his past relationships and then asking myself to him about mine. Like I, or one of the questions was, okay, I want to know about your past relationships. What are you most proud of? What are you least proud of in each relationship? What did you learn about yourself and how did you improve? Because I don't ever care to be with someone who claims they are innocent in every relationship. I don't. I want to be with someone who can look at their past relationships and see where they went wrong and be honest about where they went wrong and say what they learned. Because I don't entirely believe you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I don't. I don't, I do believe a tiger can't change its stripes, right? Like that's true. A tiger really can't change its stripes, but I do think we can mold ourselves and learn and grow and become who we want to. I do, but I think there has to be a major willingness. And so I think there's such, so much importance to being able to look in hindsight at past relationships. Like I can look so easily at all. I, I mean, I, I did this before my last relationship. I, and even with Dave, when Dave and I broke up, he and I did that. We did this exercise with each other. We actually said, okay, what are we the most proud of? Because there was so much, so much with Dave I was proud of about who I was. And there was so much Dave was proud of about who he was to me. And it, it like, it was valid and it was beautiful. And then there were things that both of us could see that we had done wrong. And I don't want to say wrong as in right or wrong, but we did that caused hurt, you know, that we felt bad for. And we actually talked about it. This is actually... Part, sorry. This is actually part of what made Dave's and my relationship or friendship so beautiful. Because Dave wasn't to me who he was to Rachel. He wasn't. Um, 
I believe, you know, he learned a lot with her and I'm sure she learned a lot with him and I'm not here to speak for her. I think it's just how it goes. And I think I got a beautiful version of him who also <laughs> really struggled, you know, but we both, there was so much to be proud of. And there was so much we both learned. Like we knew when the time came to end uh, the relationship the way that, you know, it was. And it did transition to a really awesome friendship that we always had, but it kind of, we took off a layer and then he passed. Um, but it, the, our ability to have those types of discussions was gosh awesome awesome and and i have to say chris and i can have these kinds of discussions too and it's freaking amazing you know um and i learned a lot in that relationship i learned a lot about myself i learned a lot about life i learned a lot about what doesn't work i learned a lot about what i can't be like in a relationship and i'm sure he did the same and dave got the improved version of me based off of what I learned <clears throat> or how I, you know, I, we all have errors in our relationships. I, I, I was learning who I was in my relationship with Chris and um, realizing some childhood wounds that I, maybe, maybe living inside of some of the shit of some of the childhood wounds and I wasn't even aware of them, you know, and <clears throat> anyway, so every relationship you learn, I feel like I, you know, entered into, and there was some dating along the way, shorter dating things that again, I learned more about and it kind of fine tunes you. And I feel like I entered this re last relationship, which I mean, I'm 15 minutes into this podcast, 16 minutes in, um, I just ended. Not because he's a bad person. Um, but because it's just not right. And that's a whole other topic we'll talk about in a minute. And not too much. Because, I mean, <laughs> me even recording this podcast and saying these things is like the kiss of death. On a, on a relationship for me. And I think what I need is a kiss of death on relationships for a while. <laughs> you know, I mentioned in a couple podcasts ago, I don't know when it was, because I don't know when I'm airing these, what order until they come out. But I mentioned my human design says I'm a generator and a generator has opportunities coming to them. And the hardest thing is saying no to opportunities and choosing ones choosing opportunities that you're pa most passionate about, right? And I'm it's relationships are that that that's how it is with relationships for me. They just find me. They do. And I don't ask for them. <laughs> it just happens. It just happens. And part of it is, I, you know, I'm well aware that I can literally fall in love with anyone, which is a problem. It's a problem. It's why in this last relationship, we, I did 1 million questions up front, 1 million questions, because I want to know exactly who he was. We read a book together. We did not kiss for months of dating. <laughs> True story. And, and he was so great and he was so on board with this madness of mine. And I like looked for red flags because, you know, I'm really good at seeing them, but justifying them because it's just how I am. Because in my mind, I'm like, I'm imperfect. Who am I to judge someone else for their red flags? Like we are all human. We all have red flags. I feel like oh, I, I'm not going to cast stones from a glass house. I, it would be the pot calling the kettle black because I am one giant red flag when you look at me from a certain lens. I am. The, the, and also, my white flags or my green flags or my beauty or my value actually equates the red flags that are there. And so I know this is true for everybody. And at the end of the day, it's like every partner that I am with is going to have red flags. 
right? And so there's a part of me that's like, well, who am I to say this person's not suited for me when I don't think it's about finding the perfect person. I think it's about finding the person you can work through it all with, you know? And I get it. Like there are things about Dave and I that um, would have made it impossible. And it, it did make it impossible. And so that was a relationship that had run its course and it sucks. It, it really sucks. I do not talk about it a lot, but he was so wonderful in so many ways, you guys. Like, like our friendship and our ability to talk through things, I've never experienced anything like it. Never, not even close. How he did his best to value me, I, it was awesome. It was beautiful. And there are parts of a foundation that you cannot build a relationship on. There were parts of our foundation that we could not build a relationship on. And that, that sucked. It sucked. And, and it just was what it was. And also, it was like, man, he set the bar so high <laughs> in so many ways. You set the bar as high for me as my dad did for my mom. And it, it's interesting <laughs> that they both had similar struggles. <laughs> Which then has me wondering, does every man who treats a woman like an actual queen struggle on that deepest level? Is that just how it is? You know? Okay, what I was saying at the beginning, I said these are, it's two sides of the coin, right? So the first side I went through, it's all the beauty. It's all the stuff that we learn that truly does make me a better partner and a better person. It does. And if you're there, you know. And you know what? I actually believe that inside of a relationship with one person for the rest of your life, you can go through these evolutions with them. You can. You don't need multiple partners to learn, but you both have to be willing to evolve and grow and transform together. And and you can. But the, gosh, it makes it easy. <laughs> when you lose something that you don't want to lose and you are sitting there faced with the pain of the shame and the guilt and the consequences of why that relationship didn't work that weighs on you, like you're going to run into the same problem again if you don't fix it. So the way to, to move forward is to fix it, right? It's to be better. It's to do better. It's to show up better. It's to be my best self. And I'm not perfect, but I'm better today than I was yesterday and the day before and the year before. Now that's the good side of the coin. The hot, the flip side of the coin you know, to the saying, hey, all these relationships have made me a better person. The flip side is the negative self-talk. And I know whether you've been married or not, been through multiple relationships, that negative self-talk says, I've tried so many times and I can't make it work. Am I broken? Am I not meant for a relationship? You know, I mean, I, is it really possible that after this many years, I haven't found someone that I can make a relation that's worth making a relationship work with? Is it really possible? I guess it is. Or, or am I the common denominator? Am I the one who cannot make it? Or do I give everyone a chance that I shouldn't give a chance to? And that's possible. You know, it might not, I, 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 I just don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know where the line is. And it's a little bit difficult. And then I think there's a part two, and I'm just going to say this, you know, as a woman who has four kids, I support my family. I work. I always have. This is the less I've, least I've worked in the past year and a half. Um for reasons I don't need to go into because I've already talked to you about it. But um, is it possible that when we women begin doing things on our own, right? We're already the nurturer because that's who we are. That's how we're born and wired and that's we're the mom. And then when we become the provider, 
We are the nurturer. We are the provider. We are the creator. We become the alpha. We are the alpha and we are the beta. We are actually the omega, right? We are the solution in our family. God is the solution, but like in our family, we can fill all of the roles. And I know that there are many men who are in the same position, who are the mother and the father. In fact, the guy I was just dating, great father, great mother. He was both for, you know, the entirety of uh, his fatherhood. And he did a really wonderful job. And it then you you have two people, right? Or a woman like I am who doesn't need a man, wants a man, doesn't need one. And it makes it difficult to find a man because I think men are, and I could be wrong, I'm just sp speaking and, you know, everyone has an opinion. I'm super open to other opinions. I won't count any of the other ones out. But I think predominantly many men are wired to be the strength and the provider, right? And I think it's hard for that man who wants to be recognized for his manliness and his alpha and his ability to provide and to be strong. I think it is difficult for many men, not all, many men to stand next to a woman who has been forced to provide or has chosen to step up and provide because it's, you know, the best option. Um, I think it, it can make some men feel weak or emasculated or not enough, right? Where sometimes that soft feminine is what can make a man feel needed. And then that, you know, vice versa, it can make that woman feel needed in her soft feminine nature. And I do struggle with the soft feminine. O oddly, and Dave had a lot of masculine or a lot of feminine in him. And it was awesome, right? And I somehow amplified his masculine and he amplified my feminine. There was actually like a balance with the masculine and the feminine that was, it really worked with us. Um, and I think it is just generally harder. Uh, and I think we have a higher bar. You know, it's like, <laughs> if it feels too hard, um, do we want it? You know, I also think in this era where I'm saying I need to spend more time with my kids, honestly, a relationship pulls from it, right? It does. I think there's a part of me that um, I am sad. I am sad that, again, he wasn't the one, you know? Like I, 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 I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. And I know so many of you feel me. I've never been on a dating app. So I guess I haven't really tried dating the way that the, a lot of people do, but I'm exhausted because I, it's like, I remember after Dave being like, I don't want to give someone two and a half more years. I don't want to start over. And then I kind of did in a smaller relationship that I never talked about. And then, you know, I did here. And it's been almost a full year. And there's so much good. And I'm really effing pissed that it's not it. I'm really mad. And I think it's okay to feel mad. I'm not mad at him. I'm just frustrated, you know? And this is also a really great thing because I do want and need all the minutes I can get with my kids. You know, and maybe now without a relationship, I'll have a little more time for work. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, guys, uh, this is just my, <laughs> this is my thought dump for the week. It is my thought dump. Clearly, this is not a call for dating because no one's going to want to date a woman who talks about it on a podcast. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. I, I think we all agree. I think everyone who follows me will be like, yeah, Heidi. <laughs> Hell yes. You need a break from relationships. I do. I do need a break from relationships. I think also super important because it's been, 
it's really been hard, you know, the past year um, because there's so many wonderful qualities that this man had. And even during times when I knew or felt maybe, and I'm sure he did, that maybe this isn't our future. I think there's so much fear of, of being alone and so much fear of, well, what if I look back and wish it had been, I had stayed with him. Like, what if I'm making a mistake, right? There's so much fear guiding. And, and I think we both probably had that. We both have that, I'm sure. And, and then there comes a point where it's like, you just can't ignore, <laughs> you can't ignore it. It's not even a red flag. It's like, God is like, this is a dead end. I'm not going to let you go any further. I'm just not like, this is not for you. I'm going to show you things that tell you that your gut's right, that you and he are both meant for two different things. And it's so hard to listen to because I heard it so many times. And then I'd be like, gosh, but he's so amazing. I don't understand how this sh isn't right. Like the life he and I could have together and you fantasize about all that it could be, right? And I think we stay in relationships for the potential that the partner has or the relationship has, right? And what I'm, I know I'm, I'm not sad and grieving today, but man, it's been a month of kind of back and forth and sadness and grieving for both of us. It's been really hard because there's so much love. Because when you keep going and you create love and then it's just not working, it's really hard. It's really sad. It's really hard. And I think what we both grieve is the idea of who we could be together in the future. Like we're grieving the fantastical idea of the partnership that idealistically he could give me and I could give him and our ideas are so different, right? They're the same in so many ways and they're different. And I think in relationships, we then as partners try and shove that person into the box that we have and they're trying to do the same. And one thing I am realizing is that if you don't feel like you can be you in a relationship, and I think there were parts of he and I both that didn't feel like we could be who we were. It's probably not a relationship that's right. You know, because what happened, I, I am somewhat of a chameleon. And so I will become what I think the person wants, which is super codependent. I'll become what they want so that I can be accepted. And I can, and it's not, I don't even think I'm doing it knowingly. I think in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I could see my life going this way. It's like a real thing. And then I keep doing that to the point where I'm like, who am I? And what am I doing? And same for him. You know, I'm sure he had moments of who, and again, he loved me so much. And I loved him so much. And still, sometimes love's not enough. It's not. And guys, four kids makes it hard. And I don't want anyone listening who has kids to be like, oh man, is dating going to be hard for me? Because it, 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 you know, it, it worked and it also didn't because my kids always come first. And I think that's very difficult for a partner um, at this point in my life because my kids are super first, you know, and and maybe they're super first because there have been times where I don't feel like I put them before my relationship, if I'm being honest. And I don't think anyone wants to feel like a second, you know. And so I can see how things were probably pretty difficult. And then same, right? Like his fatherhood is his number one. And it should be. <sighs> a couple morals of the story. Um. Number one, and this is a pep talk to myself, don't be afraid of being alone, Heidi Lynn Lane. In fact, embrace it. Because I do think I've mastered <laughs> how to be a partner because I've done it so many damn times. What I have not mastered is how to be alone. And because I have not mastered not being alone, or I have not mastered being alone, 
I think it keeps me inside of things out of fear of being alone, keeps me inside of things that maybe aren't meant for me right now. You know? Uh, not, second moral of the story, moral of today, is <clears throat> Justin Bieber says it best. Some people come in your life for a reason. Others, they come in your life for a season. And, you know, baby, you are a lifetime. I don't have my lifetime yet. Actually, my kids, <laughs> babies, you are my lifetime. You know, and gosh, like I, you know, I, I, I th I'm struggling with the ending of the current relationship because it's just harder because he's such a great person. And I can honestly look at every relationship of the past and be so grateful for who they have been, what they gave me, know that I contributed to them in some way. And have things that I'm proud of, things that I regret, that I've learned from. And it's awesome. Like I, I you know, I, I can do that with all of them. And now, um, I think it's time for me to do that with this one. <laughs> right? Not point the finger and say he's wrong. Because there's no right or wrong literally ever. There's just what it is. And do another inventory and say, okay. What aspects of that relationship am I proud of? Like, what? how did I show up that I'm actually proud of? Okay, what things inside of that relationship do I wish I had done differently? Like, what am I not proud of? Who was I? Like, because there are ways I was in this last relationship that, man, I'd never seen that version of Heidi. And that to me is like, okay, those are unhealed wounds that still need to be worked on. So time to get to work. And what have I learned from this? And what am I going to do moving forward? And I think that moving forward is easy. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to be with my kids. And I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to not be in a relationship anytime soon. Um, I think the final moral, moral of the story is trust yourself. Like when your gut tells you something. Understand that that is God telling you something. And you can ignore it and ignore it and ignore it until it smacks you in the face. There was a <clears throat> really great quote that I remember, and this has never ceased to not be true. And the quote is something to the tune of, the universe will continue to remove things from your life that you place your value in until you realize that your value is no longer there. And I think that's what happens. Like if you're not going to make a step, if you're not going to leave something that's not right for you, right? The universe is at some point going to smack you in the face, give you a God smack and remove it for you or just make it so painfully obvious that it's not right, that you have no choice. <laughs> But to move on. <sighs> and let me just say this. I think I helped my last partner learn things that will serve him so well in his next relationship. And whoever he ends up with is one lucky lady. She really is. And I'm super sad it's not me. And also... I know it's not me, you know. All right, guys, it's early in the morning right now. My kids are, they're not awake yet, but I should go wake them up. <laughs> uh, I love you all. This is 45 minutes of talking. I hope there was something in this that you got out of it. <laughs> I really do. And I don't know when I'll be back. Maybe it's next week. Maybe it's in two weeks. But until next time, I really appreciate you being here. And um, thanks for letting me talk. I love you. <laughs>